Welcome to the show, Dr. Lean Norton. Thanks for having me, Jason. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. So psyched you're here. You are our officially our first health expert uh, on this show. So I'm really psyched to talk about health as it pertains to relationship with self and others. Yeah, me too. I've I've done like one other kind of relationship style podcast. So and I've I've followed your your work for a few years now and really enjoyed it. So thank you. Yeah, man. Of course. Cool. Um, how do you introduce yourself when people ask, hey, who are you? What do you do? Uh, that's always a hard question to answer. When people say, hey, what do you do for work? Um, so I describe myself as a meathead who loves science or a science geek who loves lifting heavy things. And you can six of one half dozen of the other with that. Um, basically, I would say my 60 second spiel is uh, I got bullied a lot growing up. Uh, I got into weightlifting to like kind of try and fix that, you know, maybe get some attention from girls and, you know, lifting weights didn't really fix either of those things, but it did. Uh, I fell in love with lifting weights and, um, you know, it really helped propel me and not the improved physique or strength or anything like that gave me more confidence, but actually, you know, dealing with setbacks in my lifting career and that sort of thing and, and working through those is actually what built a lot of confidence for me. Um, you know, getting through those plateaus and 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 moving forward and hitting goals that just built a lot of confidence over the years. And um, so I did. I got into this, did a PhD in nutritional sciences. Uh, my bachelor's is in biochemistry. And then uh, while I was doing my PhD, I started one on one coaching online before everybody on Instagram was a one on one coach. And uh, this is like circa 2005. Started my coaching company, and then from that, I've you know formed other companies. So we still do my company, BioLane, still does one-on-one coaching. Uh, like we have a team of coaches. I have a nutrition coaching app called Carbon Diet Coach. I have a supplement line called Outwork Nutrition, and I also have um, like we have subscription uh, research review on our website. And then also like I do uh, education. I have something called Physique Coaching Academy, where basically we try to help uh, coaches who want to coach nutrition and ex- and resistance training. Uh, upskill. So kind of just went full in entrepreneurship and kind of every level of the fitness industry. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I, I love your, um, your range. Uh, I've listened to many podcasts, uh, that you've done with from Huberman to Peter Tia to all kinds of other folks and then your own podcast. And, um, yeah, I'm just impressed with you can talk about weightlifting, you know, and strength training. Uh, and then you can talk about like your diet and weight loss and, um, you're, I know you're one of the things I respect about you is you're a data nerd and you, science you're like, no, if it doesn't have good research behind it, it's you're skeptical and you say that pretty clearly online. And, uh, obviously you're sometimes challenging people online because they're, you know, we have lots of health experts on Instagram these days. Absolutely. So. And, you know, I think I've come from a unique situation where, you know, I, I've, I've done the deep science. I understand the deep science. I understand it on a behavioral level because I've coached, you know, probably close to 2000 people over a 15 year period. Um, my company has coached probably, I would say over 5000 people. And, um, you know, I've also competed myself on a very high level. Um, and I think that that kind of blend of understanding the underlying science with, you know, having experienced it yourself applying it to yourself and then applying it in a communicative manner. I just felt like that kind of gives me a little bit of a, a unique spin on a lot of this stuff. Yeah, totally. Which I appreciate. Okay. We're going to jump around a little bit. I got loads of questions for you. We'll see how many of them we can get to. Um, sure. When you, when someone asks you just like the lay person says, Hey, um, what are, what are some of the like three to five things that I need to be thinking about if I want to be like a healthy human being. And let's say I'm more 40 and up. Um, what, what are like three things that are just like mandatory for every person? So I think on a, on a mechanistic level, you know, the first, the first thing is, you know, not eating too much. That's, that's on a mechanistic. Moving your body. That's extremely important. Uh, and then just, you know, limiting, uh, let's call them, um, non-essentials that can negatively impact you, right? So, um, those would be like things like smoking, drinking, 
uh, you know, drugs, uh, drug use, those sorts of things. Um, you know, everybody says to limit stress, not always the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Everybody's good at saying it. Very few people are good at doing it. You know, yeah. uh, sleep is another one we could throw in there, but I, you know, I think if I had to list my top three, those would be it. Um, and I'm not somebody like, Hey, like I'll, I'll post a, you know, a video of me, like enjoying like a, a cigar or something every once in a while. I'll tell people like, listen, you know, being healthy doesn't mean you never, ever, ever do something unhealthy because I found people that kind of have that mentality of I have to be perfect all the time. Those are the folks that when they're not perfect, they go off the deep end and it kind of turns into a free for all. And that's not a good thing either. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'll, you know, I might have a few drinks a month, that sort of thing. I, you know, I might have a cigar, you know, every few months or something like that. But for the most part, you know, I don't real I don't smoke cigarettes. I never really have. Um, you know, I don't, I've never been a heavy drinker or anything like that. And just those two things right there, I mean, will put you so far ahead of so many people, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. just two, two kind of, I don't want to say easy because beating, if you're addicted, beating addiction is not easy, but there are two things you don't need them to live right now where it gets difficult is with the food component. You have to eat to live, right? Like mm -hmm. you can't just stop eating. Totally. Um, and so I think with their, you know, that's a whole, I mean, we could do a whole podcast on just like, how do I avoid eating too much? Right. Um, and this is a very complicated and nuanced topic, but I, I think there's two big things. The first thing I think is choosing foods that are going to be more filling and more satiating to you, uh, which are typically foods that are higher in protein, higher in fiber, uh, re lower in refined carbohydrates, uh, you know, and, and not packed with a bunch of oil. Uh, you know, it's so easy to get extra calories into your diet without realizing it. You know, people all the time will say, well, I, I have a salad for lunch. And it's like, yeah, but you have dressing and nuts and bacon on that salad. Mm -hmm. And you're actually eating about five to 600 calories more than you think. I mean, if you ever need an eye-opening experience, just go to Cheesecake Factory and look through the salads <laughs> and you can find salads that are 2000 calories, you know, like literally like almost your entire day's, you know, allotment. Uh -huh. So, and that brings me to my next point, which is, you know, just if you're not sure if you're really struggling, I know people hate to do this, but I, I would never tell somebody, hey, you've got to weigh out every single piece of food you eat for the rest of your life. Like nobody's going to do that. It's not sustainable, but it's good to give yourself an audit every once in a while. Like if you've never actually tried to track your food intake, just doing it for a few days can be a very eye-opening experience. In fact, I will tell people I've done a PhD in nutrition. The most about nutrition I ever learned was simply by tracking my own nutritional intake. Mm -hmm. uh, because you become, you know, I kind of came from the opposite end where I was a skinny kid growing up, had trouble gaining weight. And I started tracking my calories. And I, I remember thinking, I, I got to be eating like 4,000 calories a day. And I was eating like 2,300, you know. Mm. And so it's hard to modify if you're not measuring. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah. Yep, so fair. like I tell people, like if you're, hey, if you're, if you're comfortable with your body composition, if you're maintaining just fine, you're not overweight, you're not obese, you're in good shape. Hey, and, and you're not tracking. Fantastic. No need to start now. Cause obviously like intuitively you're doing well. Um, but if you're somebody who's really struggled, you feel like you're going in and out of diets and not really getting very far. You know, I think having a few days of, of really like having an honest accounting of what you're eating can be really beneficial for people. Just like if you're having trouble financially, people don't want to do this either. Sitting down and, hey, seeing where your money's going, you know, like what, what are yeah. you spending it on? Because if you're making, you know, $6,000 a month, for example, but you're not saving money, then regardless of how you feel, you're spending too much money, right? Mm -hmm. And so the same thing can apply with nutrition. I'll tell people, hey, just because you feel restricted doesn't mean that you're in a, in calorie restriction. Okay. So right. you can feel restricted and still not be eating in a manner that facilitates weight loss. So wrapping that all up, uh, I didn't really touch on exercise. So I'll touch on that real quick. Well, let me, let me ask you a question first about the yes, measuring food. Ahead. When you say measuring food, are you talking about like, I actually get out a scale and I put a, my chicken on there and my salad on there and I weigh it? Is that what you mean? I think, um, for, for a periods of time that can be very, very helpful for people. What is a period of time? Um, like a day, a week? If I can get people to do a week, I think that's really great. Um, yeah. just because, you know, 
everybody can have good days and then people can have bad days. And usually one of two things happens when people do this. I'll, in fact, I used to have clients start. I would just say, hey, just I don't want you to change anything. Just track what you're eating. And one of two things would happen. Um, they'd either lose like two or three pounds in the first week and go, oh, my gosh. And I'd be like, well, what happened? And they were, it turns out they weren't snackling, snacking or nibbling anymore because they didn't want to put that stuff on the scale. Uh-huh. You know. And if you look at people, the research data on people who lose weight and keep it off, one thing they don't really do a lot of is snack. Um, especially when you look at like food recalls, people remember their meals. They don't remember their snacks. And yeah. that's because it, it, snacking tends to be an unconscious totally. kind of like, I want my crunchy you know, snacks in the middle of the day. Yeah. Or like you're doing it because of a social situation, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. So, you know, so that happens or people come back and go, oh man, I thought I was eating 1800 calories. I was eating 2700, you know, and that is, that is not uncommon. In fact, in a, in a, in one, in a classic nutrition research study, I think back in 1992, they had people who self-reported could not lose weight even on low calories. So these people claimed that they were eating 1200 calories a day and they put them in what's called a metabolic ward, which is where basically they're able to track their food intake, their energy expenditure, their basal metabolic rate. They can take all sorts of measurements. And they found that on average, these people were underreporting their caloric intake by 50%. And that uh-huh. actually shows up pretty consistently in the literature. Even dietitians underreport by about 10%. And these are people who are professionals. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think people will see that and they'll say, well, people lie about their calorie intake. And I don't think it's, I actually don't think it's typically lying. I think it's that people just aren't aware. They don't know no. what a portion size is. You know, if you, if you want to be, uh, if you want to be depressed, go weigh out a serving of cereal or go weigh out a serving of ice cream or peanut butter. I mean, when you look at that and you look at the, what you usually grab for yourself, you realize, oh, wow, I'm eating like two, three, four servings at a time. Uh huh. Okay. D- dumb question. Measuring food. So you get your measure out and you're, you're talking calories. But when I think of measuring, I think of grams. So sure. what's the conversion there? How to, is that pretty straightforward? So it depends. So if you, if you have, you know, dietary fat is nine grams per ca- or nine calories per gram, carbohydrate and protein are four calories per gram. But one of the great things we have now is you have all kinds of apps. Like, for example, not to toot my own horn, but our app, Carbon Diet Coach, yeah, Carbon Diet, has right. a food scanner on there. So what you can do is you just weigh out, like, let's say you're having, I don't know, you know, uh, 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 some yogurt or something like that, right? So you take, you put the bowl on your scale, put the yogurt in your bowl, see how much the yogurt weighs, and then you just scan the label and type in, okay, it was 300 grams. Okay, 300 grams. And then it'll show you what, you know, what the nutritional re- values are, mm-hmm. you know, back when I started doing it, here comes the back in my day speech, but you know, <laughs> circa 2001, I had a book that was about this thick and I would have to, you know, I have to weigh out what I wanted. Then I'd have to buy, you know, by hand by with a calculator, but I'd say, okay, well that was point, you know, point one point two five of a serving multiply that by these numbers in the serving. And now I've got my protein, carbs and fats, you know, it just ended up being yeah. kind of a uh, kind of cumbersome, you know, but getting used to that made it really easy when these apps came out. There are a lot of good apps, even besides the one we have, you know, the most sure. popular one is my fitness pal and others. So it is something that you can do now relatively easily. Okay. So I'm going to, I want to circle back to this with my own sort of protein intake, but when we get to protein, I'll, I'll ask about that. Um, sure. Since we're on nutrition, we'll come back to weights, also lifting weights um, and exercise. I, I want to talk about things I've heard you. First of all, it's very refreshing to hear a health wizard talk about occasionally having a beer or having some Skittles before a workout. I've heard you say that before because what God forbid. <laughs> yeah. God forbid because the food rules and, and I have gone through many, I've done just about every diet slash um, nutrition protocol to heal my gut and from carnivore diet to um paleo to keto to, you know, you name it. I feel like I've done it. And um, anyway, the health industry seems a little rigid sometimes when people come out with their plans and you're, I feel like you're pretty balanced, which is refreshing. Hey, quick interruption here. Imagine a career that draws on your passion for personal growth and relationships that harnesses your ability to support, challenge, and connect with others that helps you develop as a person while you help others at the same time. 
What if you could earn a living while making an impact on thousands of people's lives and even on the future of society and how we treat each other? It'd be pretty cool, right? Well, that job does exist. It's the job of a relationship coach, and I believe that the relationship coaches in the world are going to play a crucial role in the future of our culture, not only in the U.S., but abroad. You know, one in two marriages still ends in divorce. Three out of five Americans are lonely. We've got a serious loneliness epidemic and a looming mental health crisis that's, I think, already here. Um, Couples that do well live 10 years longer than couples that don't. Okay. Um, according to the Gottmans, an 80, 80% of couples are headed in the direction of divorce within their first four to five years of marriage. Yikes. Okay. Relationship stress is chronic disease. Um, it, it's creates chronic disease in my opinion. Um, from what I've read and the research I understand, uh, I think it really hurts people everywhere. And, uh, I think the only way to really address this relationship you could say relationship crisis, really, because we, we, it looks like a mental health crisis. It looks like a loneliness crisis. But we have to ask why. What is the root of this? Well, possibly how we raise kids. Possibly it's how we treat each other in our intimate, closest relationships. And the bottom line here is that people need help. They need your help. And our relationship coaches are slowly growing their businesses and doing well and feeling fulfilled and like they have a meaningful purpose and career where they get to work for themselves. So if you want to come be a part of this amazing um, training, you can apply right now. We're taking applications. Um, that's open currently and go to relationshipschool.com forward slash RCT if you want to apply and get an interview. Um, we do offer a portion um, of scholarships to people that enroll if money is an issue and it's a big investment. But if you think of the return on the investment, uh, what you get out of this training, you are going to transform as a person, as an individual, and you're going to become a better partner, better parent, etc. And you're going to learn how to effectively help people with their relationship challenges, thus leading to less loneliness, perhaps, and less mental health challenges for people out there. Okay, so come apply for our amazing training, relationshipschool.com forward slash RCT. Uh, you mentioned the reason you got into weights was bullying, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And that, that I've heard that uh, from people who I've worked with over the years who are super strong or big is it was a way to protect themselves as a kid. So I want to talk about the ACEs study just for a minute, uh, which you mentioned on the Huberman podcast. It sounds like you have some familiarity with it. And just for the listener to review, ACEs study, uh, Kaiser uh, did a study of 17,000 people. They put them in this uh, study where the guy was trying to understand weight loss and people would lose weight and then they would come back and they would gain the weight again a, a month or whatever, a year later. And he couldn't figure out why. And he started doing deeper dive interviews on on the people in the study and found out that almost all of them had a sexual abuse history growing up. And that one of the ways to protect themselves as children was to gain weight. And so there was this kind of unconscious um, behavior in them that felt threatening actually to keep off weight. And, you know, the ACEs study is just a, it's one study, but I think it's really uh, amazing because it gives us a window into childhood trauma and how childhood trauma impacts mental and physical health later in life. And for a lot of people talk about like, oh, this is how you keep off weight. And this is this is the best things to do for fitness and exercise. But no one, very few people are talking about psychology and trauma still in the fitness industry. And it kind of blows me away because I'm like, God, this is such low hanging fruit is just mm. to ask a couple more questions about their history. And granted, it's subjective. Some, some people are, are have blocked out really traumatic events as children, uh, as adults. But anyway, I wanted to get your quick take on on this this sort of um, the psychology of health and how and why is it that so few people are talking about this right now? I think the fitness industry attracts by nature and I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush because obviously you have all different kinds of folks. I think kind of can attract uh, perfectionists and optimizers, you know, and Mm. um, people who love to overcomplicate stuff, you know, and, and also it lends this, Overcomplication uh, makes it easier to monetize things as well. You know, if I have very simple answers and very simple solutions, hard to sell. 
you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think people don't want to talk about psychology as much or behavior as much because it's kind of like, well, and I, I'll be completely honest, circa 20 years old, I put myself in this camp, which is if you're fat, it's because you're lazy and you just don't have the dedication or discipline to do what needs to be done. Um, and I think coaching people actually taught me a lot, Yeah, which was people are not robots. In fact, my, my best friend actually tends to joke that it's funny that I've had this, like I've developed this empathy for people because he says, I'm actually kind of like a robot. Like if mm -hmm. I decide to do something, I just go do it. And there's really like, I don't know, I'm able to change my behavior pretty quickly, but in nutrition, and some things, but certain other things I've had, you know, like I tend to be people pleasing by nature and that's been a really long, difficult thing I've tried to get through and I'm still working through it. Mm -hmm. um, so some things I'm good at flipping the switch and other things, not so much. Um, and so, you know, I think what I observed was kind of me telling people, well, just do this and then be like, huh, why can't they just do it? I've just told them what to do. Right. You know, I just, I've just shown them the roadmap. You know, so why aren't they doing it? And it's kind of like, you know, one of the things I, I tend to argue about with people online is people will say, well, you can be in a calorie deficit, and not lose weight. Um, it's not just all calories in, calories out. When it comes to weight loss, it is. But the problem is just telling somebody, hey, eat less calories than you burn. It's kind of like telling somebody, well, I don't think any of us would disagree that in order to save money, you've got to make more than you spend. Right. So why are there all these broke people out there? And even people who make a lot of money, many of them go broke. Well, why? I mean, they know what they yeah. need to do. So why don't they just do it? Well, because they call it behaviors for a reason. A lot of this stuff is on autopilot. We don't even think about it. You know, yeah. I remember um, being in line at a gas station one time. This is probably about a year ago. And I just got done dropping my kids off at school. And there was a lady in 7-Eleven over obese. And she had, she was checking out like, this is like 8.30 in the morning. Um, she's got like four slices of pizza she's buying. And I remember thinking, you know, old Lane would be like, wow, you lazy glutton. And new Lane's like, hmm, I bet this is just part of what she does. She probably has something in this area. And she just knows on Tuesdays at this time, I go and I grab some pizza from 7-Eleven. Like it's just a habit, right? Yeah. It becomes a habit. It's automatic, yeah. So unwiring that stuff can be really difficult. And when we talk about, you know, alcoholics, I mean, it's, it's different because it's not, there's, 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 there's some evidence that you have food dependence, but it's not, a, we don't think it's necessarily a physical addiction, uh, like alcoholism can be. But a lot of the strategies you have to use are very similar, which is, um, there was actually a really great, uh, systematic review of people who successfully lost successfully lost weight and kept it off. And a lot of the stuff that I expected to, to be characteristics of people who were successful were, were things that were in the study. But there was one thing that stood out to me that I did not think about. And the one thing that stood out was many of these people identified that they felt they had to develop a new identity in order to lose the weight and keep it off. And the reason I bring that back to alcoholics is because if you talk to alcoholics who get sober, they'll tell you, I can't go to the same places anymore and right. I can't hang out with the same people anymore. And in many cases, they can't even have the same job anymore, you know, and they've had to completely change their life. And for people who are overweight or obese, you know, one of the things I'll tell people is, you know, we you've got to, you can't change your life while dragging your old habits behind you. Mm -hmm. Like you have to create new ones. And that's really hard for people yeah. to do, even when they know it can be good for them, because there is comfort in familiarity, you know, oh, yeah. there is comfort in that. And, uh, you know, looping back to the study you talked about, I, be I believe I know the study and I believe what it was, was they were looking at uh, obese women and found that obese women were 50% more likely to have been sexually assaulted um, at some point in their life compared to normal weight women. And so... You know, is that causative? Is it not? Maybe. I think that many of them did say exactly what you said, that they felt like if they became bigger, they would get less attention from men. They'd be less attractive. 
uh, and they'd even be more protected against that sort of thing. So this idea that, well, you know, obesity is just people just need to eat less. I mean, I don't want to go. There are people who take this too far where they say there's, you know, there's no personal responsibility in this. And I think one of the things that maybe you can speak to as a, as, um, you know, in, in, in kind of therapy and coaching is, Hey, what happened to you isn't your fault, but it's still your responsibility to pick up the pieces and mm-hmm. move forward. Totally. Like nobody's going to do that for you. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get really hung up in tying fault and responsibility together. Completely. They feel like it wasn't my fault, so I shouldn't have to fix it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think one of the harsh truths of life is there can be horrific stuff that happens to you and still nobody's coming to save you. you you've got to do it. And mm-hmm. so I think, you know, when people cite studies like this, a lot of times they go, see, it wasn't my fault. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But how do we move forward from here? And I think, you know, a lot of people look at personal responsibility as intimidating. And I look at it as like, it means you can't change, you know, it means totally. you can't change. If, if we're, if we're don't have personal responsibility, then we're really in trouble. Cause that just means we're faded and there's <laughs> nothing that we can do and everything's on autopilot. This is just exactly. a giant simulation, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cool. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm just, appreciate again that you acknowledge this. I, I am um, encouraged that there's with Gabor Mate's book and his work that there are more people g- getting hip to this, that childhood trauma or sexual abuse, et cetera, plays a role in our overall health uh, later in life. And yeah. there's lots of healing work you can do if we take responsibility and we want to learn. There's We can work the psychology piece and then the behavior changes, I think, come easier for people. Yeah, actually, one thing I just thought about is uh, I had this, I was giving a seminar back in 2019 to a group of students in Australia, and I actually made it part of my core curriculum for my coaching academy. We, it's kind of a motto at Team BioLane now, which is we have two pillars that you have to have for effective coaching, empathy and accountability. Yeah, You cannot have, you cannot coach behavior change without both because if you're just accountability and all your, you know, you're like the drill sergeant, right? Mm-hmm. Well, right. that that can work for some people, but, you know, a lot of people, if they feel like they're just going to get, you know, browbeat, if they do something wrong, they're going to stop sharing when they screw up, you know? Totally. But if it's yeah. only empathy at the same time, if you're just saying, yeah, that's really hard. Um, I'm so sorry, you know, but you're not, you're not tying it back to, Okay, how can we adjust things so that maybe we can handle this differently in the future? If you're not bringing back around that accountability, the empathy piece might make somebody feel better in the short term, but they're not going to have long term behavior change. Yeah. No, like on a therapy level, and in fact, in scholastics in general, I always got my best results from people who were super firm but fair. You know, Mm -hmm. like, I knew if they told me something harsh, it was coming from a place of love. In fact, my best friend is this way. He's he's probably the harshest person to me. But also when I do something right, he'll give me all the credit in the world. Mm-hmm. And my first therapist was somebody who was very, very unconventional, let's just say. And I mean, she like, you know, like actually like cursed at me a couple of times and was like, you know, you s- this up and, you know, like yeah. you have no way to blame but yourself. But then also gave me some of the best compliments I've ever gotten and saying, cool. like, you're such a genuine person, you know, like this. So I knew, I knew when I was getting held accountable, it wasn't just to make me feel bad. It was because she and those mentors I've had in my life saw the potential in me yeah. and just wanted me to do, it just wanted me to get it. Totally. So exactly. How important is it then? Um, for overall health, if we're talking just health, whether it's, you know, the cardio, the weight training, the nutrition, et cetera, how important is it to go to therapy and get some coaching and do your kind of inner work, do you think? You know, I I don't want to say everybody has to go to therapy, or everybody should go to therapy, but most people I've met could use some <laughs> therapy, you know? I mean, right down to like... um you know, I think I I did pretty well in my life with for a long time without going, but, you know, going made me realize, like, I didn't, 
you know, I've, so I've been um, divorced twice. And in my first marriage, when I was going through my divorce, I remember going to therapy and like starting to realize, wow, I didn't even know that's why I got upset about that. Mm. Like, I, like why, why do I get upset about that? Like, why does that trigger me? You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's so funny uh, as well. Like, you know, when you talk, when people talk about people pleasing or codependency, which I definitely, like I read codependent no more. And I'm like, er, it kind of sounds like me. Yeah. Um, you know, they always talk about the parents, you know, that it's usually the parents. I had great parents. Like my mom's a little overbearing and stuff, but she's a really good person. And my dad is a great guy. But what I realized was I developed a lot of those fears actually out of my peers from, mm -hmm. from that bullying from the fear of rejection because I didn't really have many friends growing up. But like, I never could have unpacked all that stuff if I hadn't gone to therapy. And, yeah. you know, I think uh, my friend John Deloney had a great, uh, somebody called up his show and they said, um, you know, when do I know I've like achieved like mental health, you know? And John was like, don't look at it like a destination. This is a journey. Yeah. Like, because, you're going to get to a point where you think you, all, you got it all together and then the bomb's go, go, going to go off in your life that you can't help and it's going to trigger all this other stuff, you know? Totally. And all you can do is just, you know, learn and keep improving. And I think, you know, new, fitness and nutrition and exercise is that is that same way. Like, you can't, you can get to like where you feel like you look good, you're in shape, but then if you just stop using those tools, you stop doing it, I mean, you're going to go back to how it was. So, I really think looking at it like a journey is very important. So with you on that completely on your journey, just back to, if I can ask a couple of questions about the bullying um, for a second, yeah. are you saying that part of your people pleasing or helper, the helper that kind of woke up in you was because you were getting hurt and then you wanted to start protecting other kids who were getting potentially hurt. And you started being the guy that looked after those kids. Is that what you're saying? I think it was more selfish than that. Um, okay. I think because I never felt like I was part of a crowd and I never really like, you know, so many people have like great friends from high school and stuff. I, I don't, I have uh, one person I keep in touch with from high school who was my best friend in high school and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and not that everybody around me was bad people. I just never felt like I had close friends Yeah, and I would get some friends and then Something was, I was also a really weird kid to be fair. I, I had ADHD, was super hy hyperactive. Like, even if you, um, if you ask anybody who's around me, um, if you're around me for a few hours, you'll probably need a nap afterwards. Like, I'm very energetic. Uh -huh. Um, so, you know, that, that probably, it took me a while to find my kind of people. But I think just the experience of feeling like it was really hard for me to connect with people mm -hmm. made it so I probably did too much to try to keep relationships mm. that really weren't for me, you know, and yeah. I heard some, somebody say something a, a while back, um, which was rejection is protection. And, you know, that can apply to obviously romantic relationships, but also friendships as well. You know, if I've got to change who I am as a person to like keep you, unless it's a super positive change, you know, right. It, that relationship probably isn't for me. And I think I, I really had trouble like embracing that, letting that go. And I, you know, I have, I've being around people now who I see who have that, where it's still painful to let relationships go, but they go, Hey, you know what? It just wasn't going to work because it wasn't right for me. Yeah. You know, I, I really admire that because I think anybody, you know, wants to feel connected to other people, you oh, yeah. know, this yeah, idea we that we're that were independent or all this kind of like, I just think that's so much hogwash, you know? Um, totally. Any of the people who say that they're loners or whatever, th that's in my opinion, probably because they got hurt really badly and that's them trying to protect themselves, you know? So I think that people pleasing actually really came up just from me trying to keep as much human connection as I could yeah. because I didn't feel like I got it growing up. And I think one of the things that, I heard I'm not a I'm not a psych uh, uh, a psychologist, but I tend to agree with was, you know, whatever our wound, whatever kind of wounds we had in childhood, 
we we end up often choosing relationships to try to fix those. Yeah. Thinking if you know if we could fix this thing now, and I've certainly chosen romantic relationships previously based on that, um, and even some friendships as well. So, um, yeah, you know, forty one years old, still trying to figure it out. You know. Yeah, totally, man. Yeah, Peter Levine calls that recapitulation, where we basically recreate our childhood sort of system or a traumatic experience to to resolve it, which I think is interesting. And that feels true in my experience of the work I do with people. I have a saying that um, people settle for belonging at the expense of feeling known. Mm. And uh, you're not, you're no different than the rest of us where we, you know, especially in adolescence and um, young adulthood, we want to fit in, we want to belong to a group and to a tribe or whatever. And we'll betray ourselves completely and we won't, we'll hide out and shape shift just to feel like connected right and this is this is what we all do so i appreciate you sharing that yeah no, i know it is it is it's really um you know when i have gotten out of some of those and look back and come man why did i agree to that or why yeah. did i change so much like you know i should have stood up for myself more and it really actually is kind of a humiliating experience mm. uh when you feel like that you don't stand up for yourself and um totally. that's something like you know it's it's i do think like you know i tend to be somebody in the fitness industry who calls other people out yeah uh for you know for stuff that i i feel are pretty blatant mischaracterizations of the truth or outright lies yeah um and i think a lot of that is because you know i feel a lot of empathy for people trying to navigate this sphere and just getting fed so much crap when there a lot of people are really desperate, you know, yeah. and, and I don't know if it has so much to do with my childhood, but something in me, when I feel like people are preying upon the desperation of others, that really, I it mean, that really gets me. And it's one of the reasons I, I do what I do and I'm not afraid to call people out on that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's could be as simple as you just looking out for people who, you know, you, you're, uh, again, sensitive, empathic to them getting hurt or taken advantage of, you know, we need protectors uh, that, like you out there, I think. Yeah. A yeah. lot of that in the fitness industry for sure. Yeah, totally. Uh, relationships too. I think every industry has it. Hey, if you want to uplevel your life, your relationship life specifically, I want you to consider our Relationship Mastery program. It's nine months of complete transformation where you become a better listener, a better communicator, you learn how to have secure relationships, and you get an experiential taste of that. You feel seen and supported and challenged to reach your relationship goals. And really, you become a better communicator. So many, many people have gone through this course now. And we have a done with you version of it now, which is amazing, where you get assigned a private relationship coach. You get to do live group coaching with me once a month and ask me anything you want. There's office hours where you get to meet with one of our coaches to nerd out on the curriculum. And the community is very strong. And these are people who care a lot about relationships and they want to get what they want to get, which is they want to be in a relationship and not betray themselves, right? They want to get the relationship they want while being true to themselves. That's what most of us want. And this course is the path for you to get that. Here's what one of our participants in the past has said about this course. What I would say to people that have been listening to the podcast but aren't ready to take that final step into joining the course, um, the most powerful thing has been like the partner calls. The accountability um, is something that you're not going to get by just listening to podcasts on your own because I thought the same thing like, oh, I'm getting a lot out of just listening to these podcasts and I'm, you know, mm -hmm. been in therapy. I've, you know, done this and that. Um, to take that deeper dive and the commitment there's something about just the financial commitment, the time and the energy that you put into it. What you put in is what you're going to get out of it. And so, again, if, you know, invest in yourself. All right. Amazing words from one of our heartfelt students here at the Relationship School. If you want to change your life like they did, go to relationshipschool.com forward slash relationship mastery, and we'll see you in there. Okay, let's come back to exercise and weightlifting. I, so just personal quick share, I've always been sort of naturally fit. So I've mm -hmm. taken my health for granted. And so I'm like, fuck, I don't need to work out. I don't need to lift weights. I don't like to yeah. lift weights. And I've always done my quote, working out through like rock climbing and mountain biking and sports, extreme skiing, et cetera. Um, but you know, over the past decade or so, I got pretty hip to regular exercise. I finally got on the program and was like, all right, 
And I had to work through some shit that I had with my dad. My dad used to ask me, did you exercise today? Did you exercise today? Uh, and I wanted to rebel against that. So I was like, fuck, no, I didn't exercise today. So fuck you. Um, <laughs> so I had to work through some of that also, but I finally got on board and then, but only, and then I've had a lot of injuries and really only a year ago, I finally joined a functional movement gym here in Boulder. That's amazing. That's changing my life. So my wife and I are now working out there in lifting weights, resistance training, and I'm, I'm hooked for life. I think for the rest of my life, I'll be lifting weights, lifting heavy things, as you say. Um, why is this so essential, especially for over 40 weights and just cardio and just exercise? Man, um, if you look at the research data, other than not smoking, engaging in regular exercise is probably the best thing you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's powerful. You can lose absolutely no weight. Like let's say you're obese and you don't lose a single pound. Just exercising will make you so much more healthy, so much more healthy. And I think so many people look at it as a weight loss tool only. Yeah. Weight loss is the last reason to exercise, in my opinion. Um, more lean, more lean mass, more strength, better bone density. Let's talk about why those things are important. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at, and I talked about this with Peter Atia, who, you know, Peter is an expert in this as well. If, if you look at the things that predict mortality, once you get past about the age of 40, grip strength, lean mass, VO2 max. Those are some very large predictors of mortality. Now, why? Well, if we look at uh, a lot of the diseases that end up killing people later in life, a lot of them are tied to muscle wasting. In fact, one of the most, one of the most deadly aspects of cancer is muscle wasting, cancer cachexia. Mm. Uh, it's estimated that over half of people die uh, because of cancer cachexia from just wasting. Um, that means like mus muscle atrophy or what does that mean? Yeah, muscle atrophy. Lack of use? Lack of use, uh, the treatments that are, are used. Uh, also, cancer is very metabolically greedy, um, so it's kind of robbing energy from other tissues. People on can people who have cancer have dysregulated appetite, all kinds of stuff. Um, so that that's that's one part of it. Um, the other part is that people don't really think about is if you look at elderly, if they have a fall and break a bone, the chance that they will leave the hospital again is pretty low. Hmm. especially if they break something like a leg or a hip or something like that. It usually those folks end up never leaving the hospital again. Wow. And we get so focused on bone mineral density. Okay. Let's prevent the bone from breaking. If they also had the strength and coordination and balance to not fall in the first place, you wouldn't be worried about breaking the bones. And so then of course there's the bone mineral density aspect. And then uh, VO2 max is closely tied to, you know, cardiovascular health, um, and you know, which obviously like heart disease is the number one killer of men. And I think women as well, right now we get really, yeah. I think we get really scared of cancer and cancer is a big concern, but I think cancer is so scary because it's the unknown, like, and it, because you kind of, we all have this idea of like, if we get cancer, it's going to involve this like downward spiral that is traumatic for everyone involved and uh suffering right like an attack anywhere in your body and yeah it's it's very very scary whereas cardiovascular disease we're like oh somebody had a heart attack and died that sucks it's traumatic but it's like it happens fast and so i think cardiovascular disease doesn't really get the the play it should uh because it's so in many cases so preventable so preventable so um regular exercise is huge with that now a lot of the questions I get from, you know, men our age is, well, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60. What's, what's the point? There was a study done at University of Illinois where I did my PhD right across the street from where I did my research. They took frail elderly people who could barely stand up and they had them start resistance training. Now, initially resistance training was this, just them squatting their body weight to a high chair, right? Yeah. So progressive overload for them was they gradually lowered the chair. Right. Yeah. By the end of the study, these 75 plus year olds who were frail initially 
added significant lean mass, and some of them were basically doing like full squats by the end. Um, you know, yeah. which for like a so feral cool. elderly is incredible, right? Yeah. So when is the best time to start? The best time to start is now, right wherever now. you are, right now. Um, there you uh, will absolutely reap the benefits from it. In fact, we see that um, people over the age of 40 still add just as much lean mass as a proportion of their starting lean mass as people who are in their 20s. Now, yeah. the thing is, you may never peak out your muscle mass at the same level that a 20 year old will because they just have more time under tension. Um, but you can add some pretty significant amounts of lean mass. You can look great. There's people, uh, there's people who like don't start lifting till their forties who build fantastic physiques. But even more than that, like just getting in and doing something. Here's, here's another caveat that I think is important. A lot of people think the dosage that you need is really high for exercise. Well, if I can't go an hour every day or two hours, five days away, it's a waste of time. No, no, no. Uh, at a basic level, let's say all you want to do is walk. If you get 8,000 steps in a day on average, your risk of all cause mortality goes down by like over half. Damn. So like just moving your body is incredibly helpful. Um, resistance training, go in and do 30 minutes, three times a week machines. If that's all you want to do. Great. Yeah. You know, I tell people, Hey, listen, you don't have to get in there and do like I do, which I'm like in there for two, <laughs> two, three hours a day, like squatting you know, a thousand pounds, Shit. squatting 600 pounds. It's like, don't, <laughs> like, that's the, like, that's the extreme, you know, like <laughs> people are like, Oh, you're so dedicated. I'm like, Hey, don't give me too much credit because dedication for me would be me staying out of the gym because I love to train, right? Yeah. So if you don't like to train, find something that you do like. Like you were talking about rock climbing, extreme skiing. Those are all great forms of, of exercise. And, you know, with rock climbing, you are resistance training. You know, you're using your body weight, but it's still resistance. Yeah. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to build slabs of muscle to, you know, really drastically reduce your risks of mortality and cardiovascular disease. Um, really just getting like some activity in, like, I would say the benefits of that exercise kind of go in like a, a an asymptote. And I don't know if you're familiar with the mathematical term, but basically, um, the benefits with a little dosage are pretty sharp. And then as you get to a moderate or high dosage, they start to level out. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just getting in three, four hours of, of some form of activity a week, even if it's going to walking your dog or like I said, find something you enjoy. People say, what do you think about CrossFit? I'm like, well, what's the goal? If the goal is to be the most muscular person you could possibly be, it might not be the best thing. But if the goal is to be in good shape, build some muscle and cardiovascular endurance, fantastic if you like it, you yeah. know, but it's all about what is something you enjoy that you will stick to consistently. So find that and do that. Okay. Amazing. Um, just with limited time, I'm going to transition back to food, <clears throat> protein and fiber and food rules. Um, will you do your quick rant on food rules? I, I found your position really helpful, which was, you know, the short of it for me was I've gone through different restricting of food and it creates, and uh, some people don't talk about this. It created more stress for me, which so now Absolutely. I'm in a sympathetic arousal thing now I'm stressed about food and had I not had the food rules there, I wouldn't be stressed, which is makes it harder to digest my food. So, um, cause there's a lot of listeners I'm guessing that are like, I'm, you know, gluten-free fine, whatever. But like some people get very strict with their food rules and what's the downside of that? So the downside is the thing that you are trying to avoid ends up becoming the thing that you end up eating more of anyway. So, um, or, or, you become so anxious that there are other things that, that manifest. Mm -hmm. So I'll give my personal experience with this and I'll give you what the research says as well. Okay. So when I was first getting into bodybuilding, the big thing, this is like circa 2000, 2001, the big thing was you had to eat clean, which is a completely ambiguous term that actually has no yeah. clear definition. <laughs> uh, but it was things like, okay, you got to eat chicken breast, you know, sirloin, steak, white fish, maybe some salmon, um, you know, rice, potato, maybe oatmeal, broccoli, you know, a very limited list of foods, right? 
And there's nothing wrong with any of those foods. All those foods are, are have certain benefits. Um, but when you, when you create food rules, like, well, I can't have sugar or you can't have this, you can't have that. You can't have desserts, whatever it is. Uh, I think a lot of what happens is when you try to avoid those, like you're not going to be able to avoid those the rest of your life. Like, do you really think you're going to go your entire life without ever having sh- sugar again? I mean, okay, maybe, yeah. but um, realistic. It's probably not realistic for most people. And so what happens is because they've created this rule with no flexibility in their mind, when they have just a little bit of it, and also people don't understand the phrase, the dosage makes the poison, right? Um, so people get this idea, oh, this is bad, or seed oils are bad, or um, sugar is bad. And so if they have any of it, they end up kind of like binge eating a lot of times, or they just go, well, I've already screwed up. Totally. I just have me. as much as I want now. Yeah. And so I had that experience where I was in college and I remember, I remember when I had the epiphany, I would binge eat on the weekends, um, trying to eat clean during the week. And one day my roommates, I've been doing good all week, you know, whatever. My roommates ordered the pizza. I'm like, hey, Lane, you want some? And I remember I ate like, you know, probably a whole pizza by myself. Um, <laughs> And I remember thinking, you know, I feel like it's not the pizza that's really hurting my progress. It's probably the fact that I'm eating the entire thing, right? Uh Like, if I had one slice of pizza, do I really think I would be, like, derailing my progress, right? And so I just started, I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop trying to restrict these things. I'm just going to say, all right, if I want these things, I'm going to have it, but I'm going to fit it into my, you know, my calorie budget, you know, or my, my macro budget. And for me, immediately stop the behavior. Yeah. Like immediately. Now, it doesn't work that way for everybody. I've had people who still struggle with binge eating, even if they were being, you know, flexible dieting. But if we look at the research literature, the research literature actually backs this up. It's called a disinhibition reflex. So they looked at flexible mindset around food, which is basically, hey, I can, I, I am open to having what I want. Um, I don't have hard food rules versus people who had a rigid mindset. And I think the way they conducted the experiment was, I might butcher it, but I believe it was something of the following. Um, I believe the researcher's name was Weston Hoffman. I think they said, you know, they had two groups of people, one with a rigid mindset, one with a flexible mindset. And so they've said to both, you have to eat at least one cookie. You can have as many as you want, but you don't have to have more than one, but you have to eat at least one. Right. Mm-hmm. And what they observed was people with a rigid mindset were much more likely to engage in binge eating behaviors. Yeah. Um, whereas yeah. people with a flexible mindset engaged in it far less. Yep. And so <clears throat> what I'll tell people is like, Hey, if you want to like abstain from sugar or abstain from any particular food, fine. That's fine. But understand why you're doing it and understand that you don't have to do it. Okay. It's all about the mindset around it. So, because otherwise you get people who do weird things like I don't eat fruit because it has sugar. Yeah. And it's like, well, been there. But, but, but people who eat more fruit are healthier. Like look, look at all these, you know, perspective, all these cohort data. It's like right. we have millions of, of mounds of data. Um, and so, and then, we, and then if we look at like even getting right down granular refined sugar, if we look at studies where they control calories and they have groups that are eating high sugar versus low sugar, if they eat the same calories, they lose the same amount of weight, same amount of body mm. fat, uh, and have very similar improvements in their health markers if they're in a calorie deficit. Now, I'm not advocating for high sugar consumption. Yeah. My point is, it probably is a good idea for most people to try to limit their sugar intake simply because if you're limiting your sugar intake, you're going to be limiting your consumption of highly processed, hyper palatable, energy dense foods, but it works because you're reducing calories. Not because there's something inherently, you know, bad about sugar. And so I think when you understand that you look at your food more like a budget, like for me, for example, you know, I have a relatively big budget because I'm a a big guy Mm -hmm. and I train really hard. So I spend a lot of energy every day. Um, and so I, I like my average, like I, I can maintain my body weight on, you know, 3,300 calories a day. So if I want to have, you know, um, uh, I don't know, a bowl of ice cream at night that's 300 calories, I can still hit my protein, my fiber, all my other requirements, right? 
Now, if I was trying to get really lean and my calories were down to 2,000 a day, what tends to happen is as I lean down, I naturally progress towards eating more clean foods because I'm there's no way I'm going to feel satisfied if the bulk of my diet is made up with refined stuff, yeah. right? And so I, I try to explain it like, like a budget, right? So if I'm somebody who makes a million dollars a year, for example, if I want to spend, you know, assume, assume no loans, let's just assume no car loans. Yeah. If I want to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a sports car, but I can still pay my mortgage, put away money for retirement, you know, put money in my kids' college funds and take care of my obligations. Is it okay if I get that sports car, even though it's not a good investment, but maybe it, keeps me motivated to keep working hard because it's something I like. Sure. Which I, pr I probably should use the example of a boat because I am not a car guy. <laughs> hey. But um, but if you are making, you know, $125,000 a year and you're going to outlay $100,000 on the sports car, is that a wise investment? Or is that wise? Well, probably not for you because it's going to impede your ability to take care of your obligations. And so what I tell people is like, hey, just scale the way you eat to what your budget is. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, I tell uh, people like, hey, if you're a 110 pound woman, you know, you're not going to expend that much energy. You, you're you going to be pretty limited on what you can do mm -hmm. like treats wise, you know, it's you're going to have to be very ca careful with your portion control. So. Awesome. Yo, yo, as you know, I've dedicated my life to helping people with their relationships, right? I want to solve this problem so that all of you can work through your differences and have fulfilling, amazing, badass partnerships and relationships, family, coworkers, friends, whoever. And I have trained a ton of relationship coaches, almost 100 certified relationship coaches to help you specifically work through your relationship challenges. So I want to invite you to a special deal we're offering to the podcast listener where you can get 50% off your first month of coaching with one of our amazing relationship coaches. Okay, if you're tired of therapy, it feels like that's going around in a circle, or you want to actually set goals and accomplish your relationship goals, hire a relationship coach. Okay, go to relationshipschool.com forward slash get coaching now, and then use the coupon code first 50 to get the 50% deal off your first month of relationship coaching. Super psyched to have our amazing coaches serve you and help you get to the next level. You sell me on fiber. I, I'm like, I think I'm fiber deficient. And I'm like, what are the benefits of fiber? Like, why should I care about fiber, fiber and how do I know if I'm getting enough? Yeah, so... You said you had gut issues before, so I will caveat that back at the end of this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we know that dietary fiber, on average, if we look at mortality data, if we look at cardiovascular disease, and we look at the risk of cancer, um, not this isn't this is a very consistent finding across millions of data points, hundreds of studies multiple countries, labs, all that kind of stuff. So I'm very confident in it, which is that fiber reduces the risk of all-cause mortality, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. And when they do meta-regressions on it, which is basically they're looking at the dosage of fiber employed and what the risk is at each dose, for every 10-gram increase in dietary fiber, there is a corresponding 10% decrease in the risk of cardiovascular disease and, wow. uh, and, uh, and uh, cancer. Now, that's a relative risk decrease. So what I mean by that is like, let's say you're, because some people will go, wow, eat 100 grams of fiber and live forever. <laughs> Not how it works. <laughs> uh, you know, like if your absolute risk of cardiovascular disease, for example, is 10%, if you go up 10 grams of fiber, now it's 9%, right? Because it's a 10% reduction. Okay. Um, and, and again, there is no, you can do everything right and you can still get cardiovascular disease. You can do everything right and still get cancer. So it's important to point that out. But your risk is being dramatically decreased, yeah. you know, by consuming enough fiber. And I will say they've only really looked at, um, you know, intakes up to like 50, 60 grams a day. So it probably does cap out is my guess, but I'm not sure. Um, now what types of fiber? 
fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, you know, those are, those tend to all consistently show a lot of benefits. Now, there are people who are sensitive to dietary fiber. Oh, we also know that dietary fiber is good for the gut microbiota. So, mm -hmm. um, if we, we know very little about the gut microbiome, very little. But what we do know is that more diversity is probably good. And we do know some of the species that are associated with better out health outcomes. And virtually all those species are positively influenced by high intakes of dietary fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, and because that is because your gut microbiome, the main fuel uh, for them is dietary fiber. So they ferment dietary fiber to short chain fatty acids. Um, and the short chain fatty acids may also have some health benefits. And so, um, and also fiber adds bulk to stool. It allows you to defecate more easily. Um, there is some thinking that that can actually help because, you know, you're, you're having quote unquote toxins spend less time in your GI by having fiber go through and kind of clean it out. Um, and also we do know there is a really strong association with, uh, or inverse association with dietary fiber intake and colon cancer. Um, and so more dietary fiber is, is, is pretty good for your colon as well. And colon cancer is one of the most deadly forms of cancer there is. Totally. Just got my colonoscopy and I'm clean. So I'm clean. really good. So, good, good. So, and by the way, everybody over the age 40 should be getting, you know, colonoscopies every few years. Totally. Um, totally. So if we look at that stuff, now, the fact that you ferment it and you produce short chain fatty acids, that's where, you know, when people have gas, that's what gas is. So a lot of times people will eat, you know, vegetables, fruits, even, and they'll go, well, I don't like the way it makes me feel. I feel bloated. That's probably, probably true. Like you are having more gut fill. Uh, and if it's producing gas, that gas can make you feel uncomfortable at times. Um, and I think a lot of people conflate that with, oh, I have my gut is unhealthy or that sort of thing. Now, what we do see is people who are kind of like have an IP IBS phenotype, uh, which is irritable bowel syndrome. If they eat, if they start fermenting fiber and they ferment too much, it's not that they produce more gas. It's people with IBS tend to just be way more sensitive to the gas and the pressure. So you can have two people with the same pressure in their gut. One person is in extreme pain and discomfort. The other person's fine, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we, aren't, we aren't really sure about how to treat that, but we're, we aren't really sure about how to fix that long term. But we do know there are certain fibers that aren't as uh, tough on, on like people who have sensitive GIs. And so if people out there do find you struggle with fibers, you know, like uh, things like things like broccoli, uh, mushrooms, you know, cruciferous vegetables, uh, try leafy green vegetables um, and look at, um, you know, a low FODMAP diet. Yeah. So FODMAP yeah. is fructans, oligosaccharides, monosaccharides um, and some other things. And these uh, these particular fibers tend to be a little bit more of a trigger for people with IBS. So I would say for people, like if you're trying to get enough fiber in and you find that you're in a significant amount of discomfort, uh, look into a low FODMAP diet. What's your go-to fiber for you, fiber for who you are in your constitution? Uh, you know, I end up, I, I got into bodybuilding, so I tend to eat the bodybuilding kind of diet. So I eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables. Um, I eat a lot, I eat a lot of apples, love apples. Um, you know, just because they taste good and they have a, a really good profile, very filling as well. Uh, but I eat everything. In fact, honestly, one of my hacks is I'll do a lot of air pop popcorn, air pop cop, popcorn, mm -hmm. very filling, high on the satiety scale, mm -hmm. more fiber and more protein than uh, the same calories from like oatmeal or uh, potato. So I end up doing cool. a lot of air pop popcorn because, you know, it's like a nice little treat and um, it's very filling and very high in fiber. Yeah, cool. Um, well, I'm aware of the time, man. Um, let's uh, maybe we wrap up with two more questions here. I sure. have more, but I'm going to, you know, <laughs> downshift here. Uh, just final thoughts, Lane, for, um, you know, the layperson about their health. You've, you've hit some extremely important points and um, really grateful for that. Just anything else you want to say? You know, I think for people who are just starting their journey, like just 
don't judge yourself too much. It's, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this with therapy. You know, I'm somebody who tends to be like really hard on myself when it comes to relationships and feel like I should just get it right the first time. And it's a journey, right? Like it yeah. is a journey. Um, you know, you're not going to go out the gate and just get everything right. You're going to screw things up. But if you don't judge yourself too harshly, um, you know, you learn from those screw ups and that's fine. Just start where you are with what you've got right now. That's, that's what I can tell you. If it's, Hey, you listen to this podcast. And you know what? I'm going to go do a 10 minute walk. Hell yeah. Fantastic. That's a great place to start. If it's, you know what? I'm going to start substituting regular soda with diet soda. Great. Great start. You know, like just, just start doing little things. Just little things can set you on a path. And it's like anything. It's like progressive overload for life, right? Like nobody walks into a therapist's office has one session and then all of a sudden their problems are fixed right. and they're doing everything right. Right. It's like, as we tackle these things, as we get into this stuff, once we start to master some of these small things, then we can go after some of the harder things, you know? And so just look at it as progressive overload, right? Just focus on some small things you can do right now that will give you some benefit. Do those consistently. That will build your confidence and then focus on the bigger stuff. Yeah, great. And one of our missions here at the Relationship School is to, you know, help young people uh, with sort of heartache prevention by teaching them about communication and relationships earlier. If I had, or if you had a room of a thousand high school students and you could only give them one piece of advice about relationships, what would you say? Oh boy. Uh, this is the guy with two divorces, so I don't. <laughs> I'll say I've made a lot of mistakes, so I maybe I have a lot, um, you know, stuff to give. I I would say, you know, everybody says communication is the most important thing, but nobody really tells you how to communicate, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would say the first thing is not that you have to be brutally honest. Um, you should always try to have empathy and compassion, but don't, don't, my friend John Deloney says, uh, choose, uh, guilt over resentment. So you're better off telling somebody how you really feel about something, uh, and feeling guilty or setting a boundary and feel really guilty for having done it than resent somebody for never having said anything. Amen. And, um, yeah. that would have saved, that would have saved me a lot of, a lot of really like dark days doing mm. that. Um, and the other thing is, you know, really foster your relationship with yourself. You know, no matter, no matter what happens in your life, you've got to have your own back because, you know, I'm going to quote John again, but he said he had a, he had a, uh, a post I really loved. And he said, before you leave that relationship, before you leave that job, before you ghost that friend, remember one thing, you, wherever you go, you go with you. And I think a lot of times we spend so much time looking, well, this person did this and this person did it. You can't control anybody else, but you, all you can control is how you respond to things. And when you respond better, other people respond better. Yeah. Love it. Nice, dude. Um, where can folks find you, Lane? Yes, yeah, so my website is biolane.com uh, and I'm biolane on pretty much all platforms. That's how you can find me. Um, and I'm all over the place. But I guess, you know, if I had to say my digital business card would be Instagram and you can find me on there as biolane. Biolane, yeah. Putting out great, great content for everybody. Thanks, dude. And your carbon app, uh, they can find that if they want to kind of nerd out on the carbon uh, tracking their shit, they can go to biolane.com. Uh, Biolane, but also uh, you can find us in the Apple and Google store as Carbon Diet Coach. And uh, not only does it help you track, it actually takes the guesswork out of like, how much should I eat for a certain goal? Um, so you put it in your information and it will basically, like basically what I did was try to automate my coaching into an algorithm. Um, and you can, you can find that's 10 bucks a month. And uh, we have tens of thousands of members and it's done very, very well. So I uh, highly recommend people check that out. It's a really great entry level uh, into fitness. Amazing. Cool. Thanks again, Lane. 
Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, appreciate hanging out.